Hello my loves, welcome back to Zeke's Lunchbox. Today we are going to talk about workflow and specifically my workflow with the tarot cards. With this video I have kind of tapped into a, quite a lot of elements and chatted about all the different stages in various videos but there's no place to kind of encapsulate them all and show you the whole process from conception to the final designing stage. If you've ever been curious about each step it takes and the workflow throughout and you want to learn some art tips in between or there might be a stage in here that maybe you miss in your art process and art workflow then keep on watching. Before we head into the video I have an exciting announcement. I have just released a massive collection of tarot card prints. This is the biggest collection I've had so far of the tarot cards. Every card that I've made in 2020 should be available now. I also have special bundles. This is the biggest collection of art bundles I've ever made ever. If you are from overseas or not from Australia, I do recommend getting bundles because you do save on shipping. And with the bundles, it's a great place to start with your Zeke's Lunchbox collection. I think having the three artworks all together works really well on a wall and it just looks a little bit more complete when you have a bundle. I also have bundles that have matching enamel pins. I've got the Celestial set and also um, the Death Moth set as well. So if you're interested, head over there at zekeslunchbox.com. Okay. Let's get into the video. Okay, so when it comes to making all the tarot cards, each card is well researched. I highly recommend researching and brainstorming. This is a stage that is often glazed over, but for me, it's really helped to center the artwork and make sure that all the intentions for the artwork are placed accordingly and uh, all the little goals that I have for an artwork have been thought out. And that way I can make sure that each tarot card accomplishes what it's set out to. With the tarot cards, because I'm not very well versed with each card, I have have Julian who is my tarot card partner he researches a lot of the cards and gives me a little brief that way I also know what essential elements need to be kept into a tarot card as well this is a little example of the notes that he gives me um, and then he also finds and accumulates a bunch of other tarot cards that may have accomplished the intention of the card succinctly sometimes there are no options which is actually really exciting for us because it means that we can make a card that is really fresh and untapped anywhere else. We also have a weekly phone call that we go through where we can kind of discuss each card and pick and choose elements that we think are essential and some that can probably be cut out. An example is probably the death card. I remember that one had quite a lot of elements in it. The flag on it in the original card had Ah, I forgot. It's like a floral symbol, but I remember it was a symbol for renewal. So that's how I came up with the caterpillar scythe and how that kind of eventually went into, you know, the phases of renewal. Once I've researched things, I usually have a list of things that I need to accomplish with each card. This process is really messy. I have notes strewn throughout five different sketchbooks, a million different documents all throughout my desktop. It's a really messy process. I'm somebody who I don't necessarily look back at my notes. I just need to write down notes so I can go through the actions of remembering what I need to know. So physically writing it out, typing it out helps me to remember exactly what needs to be in a card. So I recommend doing that as well. Write it out, not just for note taking, but just so you can go through the actions and learn that way. The first ideas are often the simplest and the simplest ideas are really easy to translate. Like I said, with the caterpillar scythe, I think you can kind of understand instantly. It's a weapon of, you know, murder, but it's also a weapon of renewal. It's very simple. It seems kind of complicated at first, but you just want to kind of keep things really simple so somebody can look at your image straight away and understand and unpack it instantly. So this leads me to the sketching stage. Uh, the sketching stage often involves a lot of thumbnails. This is another stage I recommend doing really quickly. You want to try and jot out as many ideas as possible. 
Here are some examples of the thumbnails that I have done. I often find when you're in the post brainstorming stage, the sketching stage, you want to enact with a lot of speed because your brain is going a mile a minute and you just want to try and get out as many ideas as possible. As soon as you see them jotted down as well, you can see exactly what ideas work really well and what don't. So that way you can just see things a little bit more objectively. They may translate really differently what it looks like in your mind to paper. And once I've nailed down a thumbnail, I will then go on the slavish journey to find reference pictures. With time and practice, I haven't needed reference pictures as much because there are a couple of things that I feel like I can kind of work out when I'm painting and sketching. I can kind of do it by memory. So I do find that sometimes a lot of artists can get really stuck in the reference picture collection stage. Reference pictures are really good, but sometimes people be come too attached to the reference pictures, try and make it a habit to get a good balance between going back to your reference picture, but also playing around with your own problem solving skills as well. The one reference picture that I always need uh, because I haven't mastered these yet are hands. And with hands, I always have to take photos of my own hands or of my partner's hands. They give a lot of personality to your character. So the reference pictures of hands often have to be taken by myself. And just to clarify, with the sketching process. I kind of go back and forth between a paper journal and then also to the iPad Pro. I find that I like to do my thumbnails on paper first and then I go over to the iPad Pro just because you can clean up sketches super quickly and again it's all about speed. Okay, the next stage is prepping my paper and tracing the paper with my artwork. So once I finalize the sketch on the iPad Pro, I will then print it out on A3 sheet paper. I go to my local printer and scanning place in Australia. I just go to Officeworks. It's just the cheapest and quickest resource and there's one right next to my home. This stage is very clunky and very old school. This is just the process that I have found to be helpful for the tarot cards. So here are all the materials that I use to trace the paper. I will have all of the materials that I list in this video linked below. So I use an LED light box. This LED light box has been such a lifesaver. It's so simple, it's really light, and also it was quite cheap as well. I've had this for a couple of years, but I wish I'd had this light box years ago, to be quite frank. The next thing that I use is the Art Spectrum watercolor pad in 300 GSM hot press a3. Now I used to use a Canson paper, but they stopped making that paper, unfortunately. I have found that uh, just any heavy hot press paper for me, I prefer. I prefer hot press because it doesn't have a tooth and it doesn't have a grain. I think if you're a watercolor artist, uh, a cold press with a heavy tooth looks really beautiful. But for me, because my art tends to lean on the more flat, plasticky looking, super blended texture. I find that cold press or paper with a tooth doesn't translate well for printing. It doesn't translate well for uh, scanning either. But that's just my personal taste, each to their own. And another thing that I like to use for this stage is a light mechanical pencil. I try and do this as lightly as possible. That way it doesn't show up underneath the painting. Sometimes it does show up in some of my paintings when I'm in the scanning stage and I will eventually just Photoshop those out. But I will talk about that at the end of the video. All right, we are finally at the stage of painting. The painting stage in the tarot cards is well documented on this channel. If you are new here, I am working on a tarot card deck and I have a playlist of all of my tarot card paintings and art processes. I'll put that in the description for you if you wanna catch up with everything. I highly recommend it if you want to learn more about the painting stage. Some examples of the painting stage are some time lapses. I do a lot of speed paints where I kind of chat through the process of and the meaning of each tarot card. I also have videos where they're more in real time and I'll explain how to blend paint and the materials that I use, every little detail that goes in between the painting stages. Now, the paint that I use is Matisse Acrylic Structure. I like using this paint because it is high viscous, high pigment. They make a bunch of different colors. I know a lot of people like to just blend their own colors, but for me, I'm lazy and I like to work smart, not hard, and I just want 
want the delicious color that I want straight out of the tube. And yes, you can mix your own colors and buy less paint, but honestly, it doesn't come out as beautiful as they make it. They make the paint so, so well. Other tools that I use are a bunch of different brushes. I'm not that picky about my brushes. I like just, you know, regular Taclon brushes, but also some cheaper regular acrylic brushes. I actually prefer to buy them in those massive packs because I go through brushes really quickly. And um, to be quite honest, some of my favorite brushes are the like really cheap $2 ones from art stores that sometimes they're really resistant and they don't bend and lose their shape after a while. I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, like I said, I'm not picky about my brushes because I just go through them very quickly. My tip here is just to buy lots and lots of different brushes. <laughs> the palette that I use, I recently transitioned to a ceramic palette. This palette has been really easy and quick to use because uh, once the paint dries, I can just chip it off in between each session. I just feel like when I'm working a lot cleaner, it, it clears my mind and it makes me feel like things aren't an absolute mess. Like I, I'm an artist that likes to work with lots of neat strategy. So I like entering each painting session with a completely clean palette. So if you're an acrylic artist or a watercolor artist or a gouache artist, I recommend getting a ceramic palette. Um, some of the materials I use are just a regular glass of water. I like this vessel because it's tall and it holds a lot of water, but it's not too wide. Uh, that way I can kind of dip the whole brush in. I know it's not very good for your brushes to dip the whole brush in. You don't really want to get like uh, the wood or the handle part wet, but that's why I have a cloth right next to me as well. Throughout the whole painting process, I go through lots of different variations of how saturated the brush is with the water versus acrylic. Again, if you want to know more about this, I've got this video here where I talk about that a little bit more succinctly. Now that we're finished with our painting, let's go scan. Yeah. All right, the scanning process. I go to Officeworks, which is the, the American version, I believe is like Staples. I always toss up whether or not I should buy my own A3 scanner, but at the end of the day, it costs 40 cents to get a really good high resolution scan from my local Officeworks. And I don't see the point of buying an expensive scanner when I could just go next door and get it scanned. I do recommend, however, when you do scan your pieces, make sure you get them to scan it in 600 DPI in a PDF. That way it's nice and ready for online purposes, but also great for printing purposes too. All right, so once that's all scanned, I will pop it into Photoshop and here I clean up any dust particles or little flecks of fiber that often get stuck in the scan. I like to just get rid of these so they don't turn up in the printed version of the artwork. I'll also color correct everything in this stage. I like to add an adjustment layer, that way I'm not ruining the original scan. That way I can play around with everything and they're kind of non-committal and then you can kind of go back and edit them if you need to. And another thing that I've recently been doing with my pieces is I've been saving them in CMYK. It hurts my soul to constantly save them in CMYK because it has a lower spectrum of color and they don't translate as beautifully on screen. But I've been saving them in this color spectrum because it helps me keep my expectations in check for the, the printed version and it helps me get used to what the printed version is going to look like. Because because people know my artwork through its color, I think it's just important to make sure that the colors are kind of seamless throughout screen version and printed version. Okay, we are at the last stage. So the last stage, once I've edited everything, I will pop it into an InDesign file where I have my template and I've got all of my design elements. So the white barrier to frame the tarot card and also the number up the top and the writing down the bottom. Uh, I have that all placed in my InDesign file so I can just quickly edit them, pop them all together. And then, hey presto, I've got a final artwork to show the world. Sometimes when I'm presenting the artworks on on Instagram or online anywhere, I will put them in a little carousel that I make in Illustrator. 
Each card has a little blurb that my tarot card partner has written and I find that the blurbs are really good companions obviously to the tarot cards. It just really helps encapsulate all of the meaning and the thoughts and the intentions behind the card. That's it guys, that's every little stage that I go through to make a tarot card. I know it's pretty ridiculous and clunky and there's a lot to it. Each session I'm trying to figure out ways to make each stage a lot more seamless so I can and pump out the artworks a lot quicker. All right, you guys, that is it from me. I hope that was interesting and you got something out of the video. If you did, make sure you give the video a like and consider subscribing if you wanna see more videos about art and the art process journey. And if you picked up anything, let me know below. Did you learn any tips, any steps along the way that you didn't really consider that might work for you? Let me know in the comments below. Before I head out in between videos, you can head over to Zeke's Lunchbox uh, on Instagram and on Twitter. I also have a Facebook group if you want to chat in between videos. The whole Zeke's Lunchbox art community, we share and swap notes about our art and show off our creations as well. <laughs> okay, you guys, I'll catch you in the next video. Catch you later. Bye.